In 10 minutes, you are going to learn how to successfully run a SOLIDWORKS static simulation on a steel I-beam structure using the key essentials. The best part is, this method can work on any linear static analysis. There are four main parts that you need to know in running a SOLIDWORKS simulation. They are creating the geometry, selecting material, pre-processing, running the study, and solving, and lastly, we have post-processing. But if you don't execute these four steps properly, you will want to punch your computer screen. The stainless steel I-beam we will be modeling today has the overall dimensions as displayed on the screen. 101.60 millimeters in width, 152.40 millimeters in height, 25.40 millimeters in thickness all around, 914.40 millimeters in length. The material will be stainless steel. Since I've covered other part modeling videos on this channel, I will not spend much time going over the actual part creation and material selection. All right, our steel structure part is created. You can see when assigning a material, I have stainless steel selected. Please just take note of this material's yield strength and tensile strength in Newton per meter squared. This is gonna come in handy later. To start setting up our simulation settings, we are going to first load our simulation suite by going to SOLIDWORKS add-ins and clicking simulation. We'll give it a minute here to load the simulation tab. Now that simulation is loaded, we will see this tab. We're going to click here and go to new study. In this demonstration, we're doing static, so we're going to leave it. and. We can give it a name if we would like to begin the simulation. The real part of pre-processing now begins where we set up our conditions in the simulation tree on the left. You can see our materials selected, we're ready to start. First, we're going to assign a fixture by going to fixtures on the left, right clicking, and we can see our options. For now, we're going to do fixed geometry. We're going to fix one end of the steel structure indicated by the green arrows. And now that we have our face selected in our prompt, we can hit OK. In the tree, you'll next see external loads. We're going to right click and we're going to apply a force. It's going to prompt us to select an edge or a face, just like it did for fixtures. Except this time, we're going to select the opposite face on the other side of the I-beam. And we're going to do, instead of normal force, we're going to do selected direction. And now it's asking us to give an edge in this coordinate system. We're going to select in the Y direction. So this edge here, indicated by the purple arrows, you'll notice it's in the wrong direction. We are going to reverse the direction of the force as indicated now by the purple arrows. In this example, we will be applying a force of 80,000 newtons. We're ready to run it, so let's hit OK. But before we can run it, we have to give it a mesh. Generating mesh is important in the accuracy of your results. Next, in our simulation tree, you'll see mesh here. We're going to right click and begin to create mesh. For now, we'll do a standard mesh with medium granularity as seen in mesh density. You'll see SOLIDWORKS gives us a preview of the mesh we just created, but notice that in the thinnest part of the I-beam, we have one element wide. 
we're going to go ahead and do a finer mesh for better results with ideally two elements wide. Let's go ahead and rerun the mesh, this time with a bit finer mesh elements. With everything set, we'll hit OK and let it run again. You can now see that the thin part of the I-beam has two elements wide. With the mesh set up, that wraps up pre-processing. We are now ready to run the study. So let's select that command in SOLIDWORKS right now. Congratulations, you made it to the last step, post-processing. The purpose of post-processing is to display the results in a relatively easy way to draw conclusions and identify any failures as an engineer. The results of the solution are now displayed on your screen, as shown under Results tab in the simulation tree. It displays three plots, stress, von Mises, displacement, and strain. You'll notice the colors are mapped onto the part depending on the max and min range of values. Let's take a look at each plot. We'll first take a look at the Von Mises stress plot. If you have a cat named Von Mises, please comment below. You can see that our force here represents accurately how this part would deform. We right click on the plot and we can click deformed result to show it bending. You'll notice that the peak von Mises stresses are represented in the orange and red near the top, right near where our fixed constraint is on this side of the part. As we go further away, our stress decreases to the lowest possible in this range represented by the blue. It's great in SOLIDWORKS because it also points out the yield strength which is at 1.723 times 10 to the eighth newtons per meter squared. So our peak stress is obviously higher represented by the red. Yield strength is defined such that the material exhibits a specified permanent deformation resulting in failure. Going to our displacement plot, you'll notice that the colors are the opposite of the stress. That is because the maximum displacement occurs at the end of the beam where our force is applied, indicated by this plot here in the red. Sometimes it's helpful to show the mesh elements along with the colors so that you can see the elements and nodes more clearly. If we would like to animate the deformation, we can right click on our plot, go to animate, and set our speed as so using this slider here. To adjust the chart settings for post processing, we right click and we can go to chart options. Here we can do various things to clean up how we want the results displayed, like showing the minimum and maximum stresses and their locations probed on the part. As you can see, the max von Mises stress is higher than our yield strength, as indicated by this red arrow. If we would like to also define a preset maximum and minimum, you can do that as well by setting our minimum value to zero and our maximum value to the ultimate tensile strength of the material, if you would like. We'll wrap up by showing you ISO clipping, which is a powerful tool that can identify exactly where the failure is occurring in your part. Once we go to ISO clipping, we can select the slider to set it to the yield strength value of the part. With our yield strength set, we can now observe that the material left over in this visual is failing and has permanent deformation because of the stresses above the yield strength. So let's recap. We first selected material then we made sure that our part is constrained, our load is defined, and we generated a mesh. Next, we were ready to run the study, and then lastly, observe peak stresses 
and compare them to the yield stress to define failure. If you feel more confident now in running your SolidWorks simulations, want to see more content like this, go ahead, subscribe to the channel, like this video, and comment below some SolidWorks simulation horror stories, whether at work or in school. I'd like to hear those. Also, look out for the link in the description. You're going to get a free SolidWorks simulation guide. All yours. Take advantage. Please do so. Also, if you go to my website, housedesign.com, I have an amazing SolidWorks simulation course waiting for you. If you want to take your career to the next level, it's got tons and tons of bonus content worth $1,000 in there. Put a lot of work into it. Going to go in depth on a lot of these topics covered today. So make sure to check it out.